So, we were talking about tissues. We are talking about epithelial tissues. Remember that? Epithelial tissues are very highly vascular, right? No. They're what? Avascular. What's that mean? No blood vessels. Where do, well, then where does it get all of its food? All its cells need food. All cells need food. Who's underneath? That's what sticks it to the underneath. Connective tissue. When we talk about connective tissue in a moment, we're going to see that that's where all the blood vessels are. And that's where the epithelial layers are going to get their nutrients from. What is this? I know everybody took that test and went, woo! See, and that's another thing you can't do. You can't go, woo! You can do that for the day. Maybe you'll have a, woo, have a couple of drinks, have a little party. But then you've got to jump right into it again the next day. There's no woo until when? December 21st. Then you can go woo for a month. Yes? That, that can't happen any, you, every day, every day. This is your job. Yes? Glands. This particular cell that we see on here is a cell that we're going to find dotted throughout different epithelial layers. They're called goblet cells. And what are they doing for me? talked about it when we had our disgusting smoking talk about the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells. Remember that one? Goblet cells. So they're going to secrete mucus outside some of these epithelial layers. And what do you think the membranes are called that have epithelial cells and goblet cells that line them? That's torture, isn't it? What kind of membranes? Mucus membranes, very good. So where do we find mucus membranes? Anything that's leading to the outside world, because the outside world is not sterile and filtered for us, yes? And when we bring things into our body from the outside world, we don't want any nasty little critters to get too far in. Again, disgusting smoking talk, right? What did the mucus do for us with respect to breathing? Yeah, exactly. It trapped all those nasty little things, and then the cilia moved it up to our throat so we could swallow it and drown all the nasty critters in a little acid bath. Yes? So, goblet cells, very important in mucous membranes. The other thing under the category of epithelial cells is a description of glandular epithelia. Now, what's a gland? It secretes stuff. Okay, salivary gland, what is it, but where's that? Now, it's all in and around your buccal cavity. What's it for? Yeah, when, when we talk next semester about your sense of taste, we're going to talk about the fact that it's a chemical sense. And in order for you to taste things, what do they have to be dissolved in? Water, liquid. Another thing your salivary glands are going to produce for you is enzymes to help you start the process of breaking the food down that you're eating. So that kind of gland is a group of epithelial tissue 
that takes and makes saliva and then secretes it out a little tube to go somewhere else. That type of gland is called an exocrine gland. We have other glands, and everybody did everybody eat breakfast this morning? Who didn't eat breakfast this morning? Oh, your brain is so mad. But some of you who ate breakfast this morning are going to secrete different hormones to help you with getting the things that you took into your body into your cells, like insulin, for example. Do you know who makes insulin? The pancreas. There's cells in the insulin and in the islets of Langerhans, which we'll talk about next semester as well, that produce insulin and then spit it out into the circulatory system. The circulatory system then takes it on a trip around the body and delivers it to all the cells that need it. That type of gland is called a what? It's not an exocrine gland, it's an endocrine gland. Very good. See how many people spoke out? You knew the answer to my question when I asked it. Answer it. Have confidence in the fact that you know this. Spurt it out. Make me happy. Then I won't have to make that noise anymore. So it's an endocrine gland. So we have exocrine glands, we have endocrine glands, both of which are epithelial tissue. So again, epithelial cells were either flat or cube or columnar shaped cells with what? Basement membrane and connective tissue underneath. So what we see here is an example of some of the different types of glandular material that we find. We can have simple duct structures, and that's pretty self-explanatory looking at the picture, or we can have compound duct structures. When you look at these diagrams, you see that there's two different portions associated with the epithelial tissue. The darker color is the cells that actually make the product. So if we're talking about a salivary gland, it's the cells that actually make saliva. And then the duct part, so these happen to be epithelial tissue with what? Or glandular material with what? What's a duct? It's a tube that leads to what? Yes, someplace else. So we see that the duct structure is the lighter colored in this diagram. So endocrine, exocrine, know the difference between the two. Know what a goblet cell is. Understand that there are different types of exocrine glands. And that's what this diagram shows us. Some of the different structural classifications of exocrine glands. Now, glands can secrete, secrete their materials in different ways. Um, sometimes through exocytosis, glands can distribute their product into the circulatory system. Does everybody know what I just said? Yeah, and exocytosis is what? Yeah, making those little packages we talked about and spitting them out into their surroundings. So, exocytosis. Sometimes what we see is the glands, oop, yeah, that's exocytosis. So we call um, this type of gland a mirocrine gland. So they secrete their product out by exocytosis. They make those little packages and they spit them out. Sometimes we have cells that can actually pull off parts of them or actually rupture. What kind of glands are those called? Yeah, holocrine glands. So holocrine gl glands, um, 
secrete either fragments of themselves or they could actually rupture. Those fragments are no longer living. They don't have DNA anymore, but they'll eventually release the product that the cell produced. And then they talk about another one called an apocrine gland. And we see those in places that, hmm, animals have them mostly. Humans, I don't know so much. But why is glandular excretions and glandular, ma glandular material so important in other animals? Yeah, it's for, for an attraction type thing, smells. They give off certain smells. They mark certain places. Any hunters in the group? <coughs> Nobody hunts? Yeah? Do you de deer? Bigger animals or birds? Deer? Do you go out there with all your undercover scent? No? You don't go out with your urine? <laughs> Yeah, they, oh yeah, hunters get crazy with the scents. Well, why? Exactly, because they have so much more developed uh, sense of smell than we do. So those markers that we don't even notice in our environment are their directions as to where they are. You ever take your dog out to a new place they've never been before and they pee on everything? Every five seconds. Sometimes there's no pee left and they want to pee on it. Yes? Why are they doing that? Exactly. They're leaving their scent behind. So it's much more important in, in some of these other animals than in humans. We tend not to pee on stuff to tell people that they're ours. It probably is not going to be very socially acceptable. Yes? So know those different glands. glands. Know the difference between the two types. And just a general idea of some of the different types of exocrine glands. I'm not going to get crazy and specific, but just those simple definitions are good. We'll talk about these when we, they come up in different systems. So we'll talk about the endocrine system, second semester, and then we'll talk about some of these different glands as we hit the system that they belong to. Connective tissue. So that was, by the way, we just finished epithelial tissue. Now we're going on to a different type of tissue. This is called connective tissue. And all connective tissue has common characteristics. So they come from a common origin. When we talk about developmental biology, how many cells do you come from? Your one cell was created by what? Two cells, two kind of half cells. One from your mother, one from your father. But you started as a new person from one cell. As that cell starts to multiply, it's going to start to differentiate into different layers of cells, which will eventually become different parts of your body, different systems. So all connective tissue comes from a layer called the mesenchyme, and that's embryology. We'll talk a little bit about that second semester, end of the semester. This is where I'm going to find my blood vessels. Okay, so they talk about degrees of vascularity. So we're going to find different types of blood vessels, different numbers of blood vessels, depending on where that connective tissue is and what it has to supply. <coughs> It's all made of some sort of material that's outside the cells. Very different from epithelial tissue who's had cells that all lined up like little soldiers. We're going to see the cells in connective tissue are kind of spread out all over the place and hanging out in some sort of extracellular material. We call this the extracellular matrix. Now when we talk and describe the different connective tissues, we'll see that matrix can be very, very different. It can be everything from liquid to solid. So who might have a liquid matrix? Any guesses? Where, where do we find a whole bunch of cells floating around in a bunch of liquid? Blood. Blood is connective tissue. The matrix for this connective tissue is what? Plasma. 
Very good. And then the cells are kind of floating around in it. What's that one? Bone. So bone is connective tissue to as well. The matrix where the cells are kind of hanging out all over the place is made of a solid calcium, phosphorus, magnesium crystal formation. Okay? But still connective tissue. So this is sort of the common slide of all connective tissues. Of course, they don't all look like this but it shows us all the parts. So in the matrix, in that stuff everything is hanging around in cellularly, not only cells, but what else are we going to find hanging around in connective tissue? Not just liquid matrix. If I have to connect something to something else, think about me, hmm, I want to make a stone wall at my house. My stomach just growled very loudly. Anybody ever make a stone wall? Okay, you have cement. Old fashioned stone walls. Okay, I'm talking new fashioned stone walls. You ever see those cinder blocks? Come on, somebody must have built a wall in this room. Cinder blocks with the big spaces in them. If I pile them all up to make a wall, what prevents them from falling over? You might use some mortar. What else could you use? Yep, sometimes they fit together like a puzzle. But if you want to make it really strong. Rebar, there we go. Like metal bars, so you can bang them in between the holes to hold the structure in. When we talk about connective tissue, we're thinking about holding things. We're holding things together. We're connecting things together. So what we're going to find a lot of in connective tissue are kind of like the rebar in my stone wall. Fibers. And there's different types of fibers. There's really, really strong ones like telephone poles, kind of like my rebar. That's these guys here. They're called what? Collagen fibers. They're good and strong and sturdy. They're what help to keep my skin perky. Because what is skin? Do you know what skin is? It's two kinds of tissue together. Because it's an organ. That's the next part. So we're going to take all these tissues we learn about and we're going to talk about organs and organ systems. So when I talk about an organ, it's not just one kind of tissue typically. It's more than one. So skin is actually epithelial tissue and what's under epithelial tissue? Connective tissue. So your integumentary system, that huge organ that covers your whole body, is made up of two types of tissue. Make sense? So what keeps our skin, and you, ladies, you've probably heard of this, and those of us who are getting on in years have probably spent a little extra money than we should on products to help keep our skin nice and firm and tight, yes? So we don't get all wrinkled up like a raisin. And what's usually in those products? Collagen. collagen. Lots of collagen. So that's what's going to help keep connective tissue taut. Then we also have stretchy connective tissue. I have big, huge ears. Can you see that, what I just did? Boing. Why did it do that? What kind of fibers am I going to find in that connective tissue? Elastic. So I can pull on things and they don't break. They kind of stretch and come back. So we find elastic fibers. And then the cells sort of need a framework. And I kind of think of these fibers as a spider web. Because the cells need some place to sort of stick to and hang out. So these fibers, a little bit finer, mm -hmm, kind of like a spider web, a little sticky, are called reticular fibers. And these guys are going to help form that network of cells, a place for cells to go, to hang out. So the matrix is made of ground substances. The more ground substances, the what? 
the hotter it is. Are there ground substances in plasma? Yes. Yep. But they're in liquid form. Next semester when we talk about coagulation and blood clotting, <gasps> where do those, where do the fibers come from that make a scab? They come from plasma. They're in liquid form, but when you cut yourself, platelets are going to help draw those chemicals to the area and change them into a solid. So they're in liquid form, but they're still there in blood plasma. So the other thing you're going to find inside connective tissue besides the matrix, extracellular. What's extracellular mean? Outside the cell stuff. You get the fibers of three different kinds, some sort of thing we're floating around in, and then we have the cells themselves. So we have a couple of different types of cells that we'll find inside any given connective tissue. And again, it's going to be different depending on what the connective tissue is. We might find more or less of these players depending on what type of tissue we're talking about. The first one is called a fibroblast. And what do you think a fibroblast does for a living? Blasts things. It's got little lasers and it goes and shoots. No, that's a different cell. Fibroblasts. Hint. It's a big hint there. Help making what in the connective tissue? Fibers. Very good. So fibroblasts are very important because they're going to help make those fibers and help create that extracellular matrix. The other thing we might find in connective tissue are those little yellow thingies over there. Fat cells. What type of tissue is that? It's called adipose. That's also a connective tissue. Why do I have fat cells places? My energy store, but what else? It acts as a cushion. It acts as a protection. It also acts to help keep what? Heat. So it's going to help with thermoregulation as well. The other thing we're going to find hanging out in here, because connective tissue connects things to each other, sometimes things that don't belong get into connective tissue. Like when you cut yourself. When you cut yourself and you bleed, guess where you got down to? The connective tissue part. Hopefully you don't get down to the bone. Oh, sometimes you do. But um, you cut yourself, you bleed, you're in the connective tissue. So you're exposing that to what? <gasps> Nasty little outside critters that can then get in, right? So we have to have cells that are going to help protect us from anything that might be in my extracellular matrix of my connective tissues that doesn't belong. So we see some white blood cells. This guy we'll talk about next semester is called a neutrophil. That's one of the white blood cells. There's actually five of them. I'm going to say it to you now, and I'll see how many of you remember it next semester. Never let monkeys eat bananas. You know what that, you know what that stands for? Those are the five different types of white blood cells. You don't have to write this down. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, and we see some over there as well. These guys are going to help protect us from a nasty little bacteria. Neutrophils are phagocytes. And we talked about phagocytosis, didn't we? That was a type of what kind of transport? It was, a, it was an active transport. So I'm going to suck things up, break them down, and then spit out their little body parts on the other side. That's what the neutrophil does for me. The lymphocyte's going to help me with smaller foreign invaders. Believe it or not, bacteria is pretty small, but who's smaller than that? Viruses. The lymphocytes are going to help me with recognition of these foreign invaders, and they're going to help me make chemicals to neutralize them. 
Do you know what the chemicals are that lymphocytes are going to help make? Antibodies, exactly. So we see these two different white blood cell players here. Um, never let monkeys, monkeys, monkeys stands for another type of blood cell we're going to see floating around in the circulatory system called a monocyte. Now monocytes are kind of just hitching a ride in the circulatory system. They like to leave the circulatory system and go other places. Like what? Connective tissue. So way up there in the corner we see something called a macrophage. That's also a phagocytic cell. It used to be a monocyte when it's hanging out in the circulatory system, bless you. But it can squeeze out of the circulatory system and get into connective tissue and help with the protection. Never let monkeys eat bananas. Those are two more white blood cells, eosinophils and basophils. See this guy down here? The mast cell, also found in connective tissue, has little packages of chemicals in it called histamines. And some of you might be enjoying histamine release now during the fall season. What do you think histamines do for us? Yeah, they cause inflammatory responses. And some of you might be experiencing extra histamine release up in your where? Nasal epithelial region and sinus cavity. Yes? I see those of you. Yes? So what do you go to the store and buy to help relieve? And what do you think they do? Yeah, they, they calm down the released from those cells, mast cells. That reaction is actually quite important. So when you cut yourself, when we talk about it in Chapter 5, which we're actually going to skip until the end of the semester. Did everybody notice that? Yeah, we're going to bump it to the end of the semester. But anyway, when we talk about cutting ourselves, histamines are chemical messages that are going to call other cells to the region. So histamines in an inflammatory response are actually important because it's sort of like the call out to all the other cells in our body that are going to help fight off any foreign invaders that might come in. Unfortunately, sometimes it gets a little carried away with stimulus like allergens. And we'll talk about that next semester in the immune system and immune response. So we have mast cells, we have macrophages, we have white blood cells, we got some fat in there, we've got a whole bunch of blood vessels. So that's what we're typically going to find in connective tissue. And then we have cells, depending on the connective tissue, that are going to help maintain the tissue. So connective tissue in all forms is living. Is bone living? Absolutely. And we're going to talk about the bone cells in that type of connective tissue. So we good with all the similar parts? So now we're going to talk about the different types. So the first group of connective tissues we're going to talk about is something called loose connective tissue. And this particular tissue is what we call areolar connective tissue. Now the reason I remember this when I look at it is because everything's kind of spread out and airy. Areolar. Yes? So what are these black things? Elastic fibers. The background that kind of looks pinkish, that's what? Ground substances. And then we have cells. These that they're pointing to are the fibroblasts in this particular group of tissue. And then we have thicker fibers, collagen fibers. There's other cells in here. There's one there. That's not a very good picture. Sometimes you'll see some of the other players in the slide, but that's just kind of a breaking down lymphocyte. It's not really a good representation. Where do we find this type of connective tissue? 
go home. <laughs> Underneath, connecting epithelial to somebody else. That group of connective tissue under your skin is called what? Lamina propria. And that's areolar connective tissue. So we're going to find it widely distributed throughout the body, underneath the epithelial layers that create mucous membranes. When we talk about the different organs and the different cavities, remember we talked about those first chapter? We talked about serous membranes that covered and wrapped things. That's what it's made out of, this stuff. And it also helps to surround different capillaries. When we talk about the circulatory system, we'll see capillaries is where the whole exchange part of the circulatory system happens. And capillaries are tubes, but how many cells line the tube? How many layers? One. Very, very thin. So we have this to help hold everybody in place so that exchange can take place. You good? The next type, also a loose connective tissue, is adipose. What the heck is she showing us? What is that? This big, huge circle of nothingness. What is that? It's a cell. You know all the cell parts you had to learn, chapter three? All the cell parts are kind of squished out to the side. So what's this big ball? What's it full of? It's full of triglycerides. And where are all the cell parts? <laughs> Squished to the edge. So there's the nucleus of that cell. Typically in a cell that we see, you know, those nice little epithelial cells we saw on our cheeks, the nucleus was smack dab in the middle. Not in the adipose. It gets squished to the sides. So we see adipose cells. Do you know what this is? It's not a snake. Yeah, it's a capillary. And you know what those little round things are? And there's a big blobby thing. I like this. This was a, a nice slide because it caught some players in the circulatory system. Those are red blood cells going one by one through a capillary bed. And guess what that big blobby thing is? It's in the circulatory system. There's red blood cells and there's white blood cells. Yeah, caught a white blood cell. That's cool. That's, it excites people like me. I don't know. I need to get a life. So we're still in what kind of connective tissue? Loose connective tissue. This connective tissue has a lot more fibers in it. The fibers are the things that look like tree branches. What kind of fibers? Reticular fibers. Guess what we call this connective tissue? Reticular connective tissue. Hmm. Why? It's got tons of reticular fibers in it. And what did I say the reticular fibers were doing for me? They're like little spider webs. They're going to help be the framework for cells. Well, what are all these purple blobby things? White cells, white blood cells. When we talk about the lymphatic system and the immune response, we're going to talk about tissues like the spleen. And what the spleen does for us is it holds on to a whole bunch of those white blood cells kind of stick into reticular fibers. And just like spider webs, things can pass through the spaces, right? Like fluid. If there's any nasty stuff in our fluids, and this fluid I'm talking about is lymph fluid in our lymphatic system, if there's any viruses in our fluids or bacteria in our fluids, what's going to happen as they pass through the spaces? They're going to bang into some of these cells. And that's how they're going to recognize that they are there. 
that they're foreign and they're going to kick into action and elicit what we call an immune response. So in places like the lymphatic system, lymphoid organs, spleen is the biggest lymphoid organ. We're also going to find this type of tissue in bone marrow. When we talk blood next semester, we're going to see that all of the immature cells that will eventually be all of our blood cells live in red bone marrow. So that's where we find reticular connective tissue. Now we're not talking about loose anymore. Now I got to connect stuff, I got to have a little power. So no more loosey goosey. If I connect this to that, no more loose, right? If it was loose, what would happen? It would fall off. That wouldn't be good. So I need tight. I need strength. So what kind of connective tissue are we talking about now? Dense. So the cells are very tightly packed. The fibers are very tightly packed. And this particular tissue is dense, and the fibers are all going in the same direction. So what do we call it? Dense, regular. So if we look really close, we see a bunch of fibers. And it's nice because they kind of pulled away here so you can actually see how they come together. And then we see the cells. And they're sort of squished in between the fibers. So places like my shoulder, I got to hold on to that, right? I'm, I'm pulling things. I'm lifting things. I need strength. In this particular case, I need strength just this way. We're going to look at the next one. It's going to help me with things that have to go in different directions. So dense, regular connective tissue. What's the next one called? Dense, irregular connective tissue. So remember this? Now I'm going to take this and go like this. So how many different directions am I going in now? All over the place. So I need hold from fibers that are going in many different directions. This is dense, irregular connective tissue. Again, we see the fibers. There's fluid behind there, too. There's those ground substances. And then we see the cells. Remember, the cells are kind of spread out. They're not all touching each other. Oops, what did I do? OK. Still dense. That's kind of obvious from looking at it. Very packed tight. But I have tons and tons and tons of what? Elastic fibers. So in places that have to stretch and come back and stretch and come back, what type of connective tissue do we see? Elastic connective tissue. This is still a dense connective tissue because the fibers are all densely packed. Places like the aorta. What's the aorta? It's one of the largest heart valves leaving the heart. The heart is a pump. What does it pump? Blood. When the last push comes from the heart so that blood can travel through my entire system, it's going to go into the aorta. Huge push from behind. So what has to happen to the aorta? Wow. Yes? So lots of elastic connective tissue there. Cartilage is also connective tissue. So now the matrix is starting to get what? Not, but a little squishy, yes? It's starting to harden up a little bit. Reminds me of jello. You ever make jello with fruit in it? I'm not very good at that. My fruit always floats to the bottom. I have a little issue with the whole jello mold thing. Not good at that. I make other things very tasty, but don't ask me to make a jello mold. It's not going to be pretty. So think of one that's pretty. So you have the jello and you have the little fruits that float in there. That's what I think of when I think of this connective tissue. This connective tissue is a cartilage because now we have jello. Not liquid, not airiness, but jello. We're starting to get a little, like this is cartilage, yes? My ear? Yeah, firmer. Hyaline cartilage. 
Now, now we can actually see the matrix and the cells. The cells, the cells that maintain cartilage are called chondrocytes. Cartilage what? What's a site? Cells. Cartilage cells. So, we see them here. And they're sort of in little packages now, because now we're in jello, right? The packages in cartilage that house whatever the cell is, and depending on the cartilage, they're gonna, we're going to call it different things, are called lacuna. Like little lakes within my jello. And again, the cells are chondrocytes. Now this, if I were to envision this, does it seem smooth? Yeah, seems kind of slick, slippery. Highland cartilage is going to be in places that need things to sort of slide across them. They need to hold together things, but they need it to be a smooth surface. So parts of our skeleton, when we talk about chapter six next, we're going to see is cartilage, high limb cartilage, rib cage, ribs, and what else? Sternum, very hard. But watch this. What did I just do? I took the whole rib cage and I went. If it was all solid, would that happen? No. So the connection between my ribs and the sternum in the rib cage is this guy. So it's going to allow for a little give, expansion, things to slide across. We're going to see it here in the ribs. It forms something called costal cartilage. And again, we'll talk about that when we talk skeleton, chapter 6, chapter 7, nose, trachea. Do you ever go to Friendly's and get one of those little bendy straws that changes color? You know what I'm talking about? Boy, did anybody ever have a straw in their drink that bends? And it's kind of got that little ridgy place where it bends? That's what, you're, that's what you should think of when you think of your trachea. So the trachea is not just a smooth muscle tube, but it also has little ridges, little rings. And what, what do you think they're for? No, it's a trachea. I hope we don't move any food down the trachea. Wrong tube. We want to <laughs> want to keep the tube open, <laughs> so we can do what? Breathe. We don't want it to collapse. So we have little cartilage rings, highland cartilage, that are going to help keep the tube open at all times. So I can bend my head around and not squish my tube. Yes? So that's highland cartilage. What kind of cartilage is this? What do you think I have in it? Lots of elastic. So that's not hair in there. That's actually elastic fibers. So same thing, we're going to have the matrix just like we had before in the highland cartilage. We're going to have the little holes for the cells. What are those called? The holes for the cells. The lacuna, what are the cells called that live in the holes? Chondrocytes, they're the cartilage maintaining cells. And then all this stuff that looks like really dark hair is what? Elastic. So that's, that's what this guy is made of. So it can bounce back. There's another, it mentions something called the epiglottis. What the heck is an epiglottis? Back to the trachea again. No. Yeah. Can I do, watch this. happen in the same place, right? Different tubes, yes? Trachea is in the front. Remember, I have to keep that guy open so air can go down. What happens if my coffee goes down there? 
Not good, right? Well, I, I, I breathe through my mouth, I eat through my mouth. How does that happen? When I swallow my coffee, it sets off this little trap door called the epiglottis. That's going to close off my what? It's going to close off my trachea. And what's going to happen to the food? It's going to go down the back pipe. What's that called? That's the esophagus. When we study the respiratory system and, and the digestive system, we'll see the trachea is like this, and the esophagus is like this, butted up right behind it. It's squishy, though. Trachea is not squishy. So when I swallow, it expands, OK? So elastic cartilage is on that little trapdoor epiglottis. Then we have cartilage that is, has more fibers in it, so it's more what? It's more strong, more tough in places that need to be connected together but need a little toughness to do it. It's the reason I can do this without breaking my spinal cord. So the little discs between the bones that we're going to talk about in chapter 6 called the vertebrae, we have some cartilage. It's got to be tough, though. Yes? Yep. Now what we're going to see comes into these areas is a whole bunch of nerves. So when we talk about the nervous system, we're going to talk about spinal nerves. <laughs> Excuse me. That was disgusting. So nerves come in, feed into bone and these little discs. They're going to come in and feed up to the central nervous system for processing. It's kind of like your wiring. We're going to talk about the central nervous system and the peripheral, ooh, peripheral nervous system. Okay, so all of those wires are feeding into the central nervous system through these discs. Now that can be a problem. Has anybody ever slipped a disc? Uh, it, it can cause lots of what? Pain, which are also message receptors that are sent for processing when tissue damage occurs. So imagine taking all those wires in your house and sort of pinching off some of them. <coughs> That's what the slipped disc is, because they, they don't line up the way they should, because this cartilage either puckers or slips. Uh, huh? Yeah, because of the pain. So these, this forms, um, anybody play hockey? And you're, you're a guy, so you probably at one time pulled apart a hockey puck, right? Like, no, never. It will try to cut it open. You know? Yeah, it's really hard, isn't it? Well, it's not solid, actually. Did you know that there was like a little, there's a little. Yeah, see, I know you had. Never done it personally. But like, they're hard, hard, and kind of little squishy in the middle. That's what your intervertebral discs are like. OK, and the cartilage that makes the hard, hard part, that's this fibrocartilage. So in places that need connection but toughness, we're going to see fibrocartilage. What's this stuff? Bone. Now this is very highly organized. Yes, sir? What's the difference Where are you? Oh, look, um, on this picture? This picture? Oops. Same thing. Yep, singular, plural. So see, it, they're pointing to two. OK, same things here, except now what's my matrix? Now it's? Solid. So we're going to be very highly organized in our extracellular matrix. Um, 
ever, ever cut open a tree and look at the growth rings? That's kind of what bone looks like, doesn't it? So there's little growth rings around some central place. What's in this central place, do you think? It's the central canal, but what do you think it is? Blood vessels. Remember, this is living tissue. So where the heck are the cells? They're in little spaces called what? Lacunae, and there's, that's plural. Yes? And see those little black things? What are those? Cells. They're called osteocytes in bone. So the chondrocytes of bone are called osteobone cells, sites. Yes? So if I have, and my food supply is there, how the heck is that guy going to get any chow? There's fluid in here too, so all these cells are floating around in fluid. See these little lines? They're little canals called canaliculi. We'll talk about when we learn bone. So the matrix forms in these little rings around the food source, central canal, like growth rings on a tree. Cells actually produce it outside their cells. When you form a ring, and those rings are called lamella, at some point the cell's like, okay, I'm going to stop doing that because I'm not going to be able to get any food. So it just becomes an osteocyte, a bone maintaining cell, and it gets its food through these little canals. Your bone is constantly growing, just like a tree is constantly growing. So we see these little canals constantly, or little rings, I should say, constantly being formed around food sources. When we talk about bone, we'll see that those cells that form the bone are called osteoblasts. And the cells that maintain the bone are called osteocytes. And if they're constantly growing, why don't I have the biggest bones in the world? constantly being broken down. So the matrix that's made of calcium and magnesium and phosphorus, that's actually a storage place for those things. When I need them, and I'm going to need them, we'll see, for many different reactions of metabolism, I'm going to have to go break them off the bone. And those cells are called osteoclasts, and they're going to help me break away that bone matrix. So bones found in bone, that's easy. And remember osteo, so osteocytes. What's this? Blood. This is liquid matrix. What's the liquid matrix of blood called? Plasma. And the cells are what? White blood cells, red blood cells, and there's actually little fragments of cells that float around that are going to help us make blood clots called platelets. So the matrix is the white stuff. What are these things that look like Frisbees? Actually, they look like donuts. Those are red. Well, they look strange. Something's wrong. They look like there's a big honking hole in them, first of all. What else? They're missing something. Something's missing. No nucleus. Do red blood cells have a nucleus? They did when they were born. And where were they born? In the red bone marrow. But by the time they mature and get spit out into the circulatory system, before they do that, they spit out their nucleus, too. Because basically, they're just big bags of hemoglobin. So that place that looks like a big hole isn't really a big hole. It's just a skinny spot. So if I take this cell and I turn it this way and I cut it, it kind of looks like a dumbbell. It's called a biconcave disc. Because where the nucleus used to be is kind of sunken in. So when I look at it under the microscope, it looks like there's a hole there, but it's just a thinner area of the cell. 
so light can pass through it. These other big honking cells, what are those? These are the white blood cells. That one happens to be a lymphocyte, and this one is a neutrophil, but it's a bad example of a neutrophil, and you'll see next semester why it's a bad example. Those little things that look like schmutz over there, those are actually fragments of a cell called platelets. So when we look at this connective tissue, the cells we're going to see are red blood cells, white blood cells, and fragments of cells called platelets. The matrix is liquid. It is plasma. And is it connecting stuff? Why do we call it connective tissue? It's connecting everything, isn't it? We talked about the hormones in the circulatory system. We talk about respiratory gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Who's going to deliver all this stuff? This connective tissue, liquid blood. All right, so we're done with connective tissue. Everybody good with connective tissue? Sir? Absolutely. All about, uh, like, the vaginal canal. Mm hmm Yes. Yep. Any, any place where you're going to get stretch and come back. You're going to find it in places like blood vessels, too. So, yes, absolutely. Anybody else questions? All right, next type of tissue. This type of tissue is going to allow for movement. Movement of stuff from one place to another, or movement of you from one place to another, the body from one place to another. Moving your framework. Do you know what your framework is? Your bones, your skeleton. So what kind of muscle is this? Skeletal muscle. It's attached to what? Bones. And it does what? Moves you and moves them. So skeletal muscle, very highly organized. When we discuss muscle, we're going to talk about different proteins within the muscle cells that are going to allow the cell to do this. Shorten. Lengthen. <clears throat> in skeletal muscle, they're very highly organized and stacked. They're so highly organized that they actually form visible stripes or striations. Skeletal muscle cells are sometimes called muscle fibers because they're so long. In this picture, this isn't even one cell. This, excuse me, this is one cell, but the whole, pi the whole cell isn't even in the picture. That's how big it is. So it kind of looks like big, huge what? I, big, huge poles. I call them telephone poles or worms. You can call them worms. So what are these? They're the nuclei of the cell. Well, wait a minute. There's a whole bunch in a skeletal muscle cell. In a skeletal muscle cell, they're multinucleated. They have more than one nuclei because the cells are so freaking big. OK? So big telephone poles, striations, and multinucleated. Places that have to shorten, lengthen, move my bone. Skeletal muscle. <clears throat> the other type of striated muscle is not one big telephone pole, but actually has a bunch of branches to it. Now, when I have branches to stuff, just like I had the dense, irregular connective tissue, think about things having to move in, in many different places, not just in one direction. This is cardiac muscle. 
And what does your heart have to do? Yes? So we have cells that branch. The other thing, they're constantly pulling on each other, these cells. So they need a very, very tight connection from one cell to the next. So what happens is one cell will fit into another cell, like this. Kind of like, you know, those little egg crate mattresses you can get? If you take them and fold them together, they fit in like this, nice and tight. Those form these stripes, the connections between one cell and the next. They're called intercalated discs. And this is where I'm going to find a lot of desmosomes. But this is where I'm also going to find a lot of gap junctions. What's a gap junction? My little, my little straw that pokes through two plasma membranes so that cells can communicate with each other. Well, why the heck do cardiac muscle cells have to communicate with each other? The whole contraction, relaxation, shortening, and lengthening thing, it's all a chemical change. And we're going to talk about that when we talk <coughs> about muscles. And those chemicals have to pass real quickly from one place to another. And that's what we'll see in those intercalated discs. So these are striated. We also have two other terms. They are involuntary. Whereas your skeletal muscle is what? Voluntary. voluntary. So I can consciously say, I would like to lift my arm and do that. Yes? Can you consciously say, I would like my heart to beat? Yeah, no. You can make it beat slower. Huh, by doing what? Relaxing, getting plenty of oxygen, because your heart is going to monitor oxygen levels too, or at least your nervous system is going to talk to your heart with respect to oxygen levels. <clears throat> so if you get plenty of oxygen and you're not moving, is your heart going to have to beat as fast? So this is involuntary. It's one nucleus. So it multinucleated the skeletal muscle, we're back to the normal uh, one nucleus per cell in the hair. This kind of looks like one of those crazy fish drawings. Have you ever seen carvings with a whole bunch of fish swimming? And look really close. <laughs> and you're, you're not going to see anything like this under your microscopes because this is a very special stain. Yours are going to be pink and purple like everybody else. But the cells in smooth muscle also moving things, but now we're talking about moving things through a tube. So things like your digestive system, that's one big, huge tube, right? And what do I have to move through the tube? Food. I have to push it through and secrete chemicals all over it and then absorb some of it, but constantly have to push it through the tube. So what causes it to push through the tube? smooth muscle. So we're going to find smooth muscle in the tubes of the digestive system. Why do you think we call it smooth muscle? It doesn't have stripes. It still has those regulatory proteins that make it shorten and lengthen, but they're, different, they're organized differently so we don't see physical stripes in the cells. So basically what we see is cells, and that's one cell, and there's another cell, they kind of like little worms create the tissue. And those cells will shorten and lengthen just like the skeletal muscle and just like the cardiac muscle. No. No, not like skeletal muscle. So they're single nucleus, much smaller cells, and they're going to cause movement in <coughs> walls of things, in tubes. Are they involuntary or voluntary? They're involuntary, so I can't say, okay, it's time to move the cheeseburger from the stomach to the small intestine. That just happens automatically. So that's muscle. Different type of tissue now. Nervous tissue. Now what we find in nervous tissue are 
huge cells. They're called neurons. I have some neurons that have cell bodies that start up here and extensions from the cell bodies called axons that run all the way down my leg. They're huge cells. We can see them here under the microscope. So this is just the cell body part. They actually have little extensions that come off of them. Some of them feed information into the cell body and some of them feed information out of the cell body. They're called dendrites and axons. And these are for what? What are neurons for? What? <coughs> Transmitting message, electrical message. So when I say I have to move my arm, why does that happen? My brain sends a message out my neurons to the muscle, which will then deliver a message chemically to cause all the chemistry that we're going to learn about when we learn muscle contraction to happen and cause the muscle to shorten. So the only way my muscles can shorten is if my what tells them to? Neurons. So they deliver message. Because they're big, huge, ginormous cells, and then we see the cell bodies and processes, things sticking out of them. See all these dots in the background? Those are all cells as well. They're called glial cells or supporting cells. And they're going to help make sure those big, huge neurons get everything they need so they can live. Neurons, for the most part, and there are exceptions to the rule, once you've got them, that's it. You get no more. So once you have developed them, they're yours for life. You kill them, do you get any more? Nope. You can, and that's what you're doing right here, right now. You're creating different connections. You can create different connections, but can you create more cells? No. You have way more than you need, by the way, like way, way more than you need, some that you'll never, ever use, not even close to ever use in your whole lifetime. You only use like 20%. And some waste more than others. Yes? What things can kill your neurons? Some chemicals. Chemicals can kill your neurons. And just as we age, they get old, they die. So, nervous system, brain, spinal cord, peripheral nervous system. And I always kind of refer to them as the wires that connect you from one place to another. That's where we find nervous tissue. Oops, wrong direction. All right, then they talk a little bit about membranes, covering and lining membranes. General definition, cutaneous membrane, what is that? That's your big, huge skin. Mucous membranes, where are those? Things leading what? Out to the outside. Then we have a whole bunch of membranes that do what? Yeah, we've got all this stuff moving around in those body cavities, so we want to protect them. So we see this group of membranes that act as protection, and one of the ways they help protect is to make fluid. We call these guys serous membranes. So remember we talked about the mediastinum, what was living in the mediastinum? Who? Who was living in the mediastinum? The heart, yes? And then in the thoracic cavity, the two parietal cavities, lungs, pretty close to each other. A lot of moving going around, a lot of banging around, yes? So these guys are covered by serous membranes, two-part serous membranes. One sits right on the tissue, that's called the visceral portion of the membrane, and one lines the cavity it's in, what's that called? The parietal, and what's between the two? 
serous fluid made by these membranes. So if I'm talking about around the heart, what do I call it? Pericardial. If I'm talking about around the lungs, I call it pleural. Okay? So those are serous membranes. When we talk about the what body cavity, that big honking one in the front, at the bottom, below the diaphragm, the abdominopelvic cavity, we talk about serous membranes that are going to help separate things in the peritoneum. So we, again, parietal peritoneum versus visceral peritoneum, you understand the difference between the two terms. Yes? What's this? I cut myself. Oh, goodness. This is tissue repair. So when tissue becomes damaged, it needs to repair itself. This is steps in the repair process. You need to understand those steps. This would make an awesome essay question on your next exam, you think? Mm-hmm. Yep, what's a hint? Make a great essay question on your next exam. Just saying. So when we cut into and we see this two different types of tissue here, what is this, by the way? What system are we talking about? The integumentary system. We cut through the epithelial tissue and get down into the what tissue? connective tissue and cut into blood vessels. Oh no, I'm going to leak all over the place and die. Well no, because I have the ability to do what? Clot and repair my tissue, I can fix that all up nice. So first of all we have the inflammatory stage and this is where those histamine guys are actually going to help me out. Because when I cut tissue, I think of it as cracking open an egg and spilling out its guts. There's a whole bunch of chemicals in there that are going to attract other cells to the area. Because normally they should be inside cells and not floating around in the circulatory system, right? So when I damage tissue, it's sort of like a chemical message to call different cells to the area to start the repair process. So that's in the inflammatory stage of tissue repair. So I'm going to open up blood vessels, damage tissue, call some cells from the circulatory system to come out into the tissues and help me out. You see down there at the bottom, migrating white blood cells. What are they going to help me with? Those are the guys that are going to help eat any nasty little critters that might get in from the outside. And then we have our mast cells and inflammatory chemicals that are going to call these guys to the area. What's the next stage? Well, now I've got to get everybody back together again. I have to reorganize my tissue. So the second stage of tissue repair is the organization step. So we're going to help mend some of those blood vessels and we're going to help, with, in this case, bring the tissue back together again. In order for the cells to start doing their thing, they have to come back together again and start touching each other. So the organization phase is going to bring some fibroblasts to the area to kind of act like a sewing machine, to pull everything back together again. If you have a big scar, you know exactly what I mean. It's called fibrosis, right? who made all those extra fibers in that area. Fibroblasts to help sew the tissue back together so it could regenerate and grow. So we're going to regenerate here. Get rid of all the schmutz. Neutrophils are going to help me do that. Fibroblasts are going to help sew everything back together. Do you ever get a hole in your sock? Okay, nowadays people are lazy and they throw their socks away. Who still sews their socks? Very good. So you're taking thread and you're bringing the two sides back together again to close up the hole. When I do that, it's going to be much, much thicker thread-wise than the original sock was, right? And that's what a scar is. It's called a fibrosed area because there's a lot more 
fibers in that region that help to close up that hole. So we put a scab on top of it, kind of like a little plug, and we allow the cells to grow back into the layers that were normally there when they originally started. And that's going to happen during the regeneration phase. You're not supposed to pick your scabs. Why? You, you keep pulling the, not even make the scar, you keep pulling the tissue apart. It wants to be back together again. And that's why the scab is there. So when should the scab come off? When it's ready to be by itself and fall off. So don't pick your scabs. It's gross, first of all. And you got to allow the tissue to grow back in underneath. So that's regeneration and fibrosis. Don't worry about the developmental. And we are done with chapter four. Quiz on chapter four will be due before class on Tuesday of next week. Quiz on chapter four will be due before class on Tuesday next week.